A new prospect. Welcome to RTP 2021 for November 3rd, 2021. Hope you're doing well. Uh, so our text for today, we have 2 Kings 16, uh, Hosea 9, and I must say that in those texts, things aren't getting better <laughs> for the last few days. Uh, and then we have Titus 2, and then finally Psalm 126 to 128. So we'll start with, we'll get the, the um, depressing stuff out of the way first. We'll start with uh, Hosea and 2 Kings. Uh, so Hosea 9 is, is continuing on with um, some of these oracles of condemnation against Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, remember, you know, as we've been reading through 2 Kings, you see just how uh, far Israel had fallen, uh, the idolatry that they're participating in. Uh, as verse uh, 1 states, they have played the harlot, forsaking the Lord. Uh, this builds upon, of course, that image from all the way back at the beginning of the book of Hosea, where, uh, you know, Hosea's Sinai proclaimed Israel as this uh, harlot that has uh, committed spiritual adultery against God. Um, and so uh, because of this, nothing that they do uh, outwardly in these outward expressions of worship is acceptable to God. Verse four, their sac sacrifices won't please him. And um, and most cases, you read through uh, chapters eight and nine and, and these other texts, you'll see that uh, the blame falls primarily on the leadership of that of the nation. So you had, for instance, in chapter eight, uh, Hosea was talking about the, the kings um, who had been set up, but not by God. And then in this text, we have the prophet uh, who, who in verse seven is listed as a fool. Uh, so all these false prophets in Israel who are claiming uh, to speak for for the for God and and uh, on behalf of God uh, are really just false prophets who are divining uh, for money and who are stating these things to get on the good side of the kings and such. Um, two other images that emerge from this text that actually draw from earlier uh, biblical accounts that speak of uh, well, actually three of them here that speak of the the reasons why Israel is being judged and ultimately um, what will happen to them. So what will happen to them is something we saw uh, in chapter eight, where Israel is going to be returning to Egypt. L literally, this will be like a second exodus. Uh, well, I'm sorry, a second uh, enslavement in Egypt. Uh, so the, the reversal of the exodus itself, that's in verse um, verse three, Ephraim. Again, Ephraim is just an, one of the tribes, but the, the major tribe in the Northern Kingdom uh, so Ephraim is just pretty much used synonymously for Israel. Um, and then it'll be as in the days of Gebeah. Now this goes back to that really um, crazy passage in Judges 19. I actually just talked about that text in my Old Testament class uh, just recently. And uh, probably one of the grot most grotesque and, uh, and shocking passages in all of scripture. And that's, of course, the text where uh, the... Northern Kingdom, uh, primarily uh, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, starts to act just like um, the Canaanites, but specifically act like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and, and the Levites, who were among them uh, in that case, aren't doing any better. In fact, are act, acting even worse. Uh, and God has a devastating judgment because of that on them. And so uh, Hosea says, it's kind of like that now. Uh, that same kind of, of uh, reckless idolatry and, um, uh, and moral, um, just uh, horrendous uh, moral actions on the part of the, the people of Israel are going to be judged. And then finally, uh, there's the uh, reference to um, uh, Baal Peor, which goes all the way back, of course, to the Exodus account in the book of Numbers, uh, where Israel's going out and remember where um, where Balaam, um, in that story of Balaam, uh, after he is unable to pronounce curse over Israel uh, in the book of Numbers, at the end of the book of Numbers, he ultimately in Numbers 25, I think, uh, ends up saying um, or getting the, uh, the people of Moab uh, to seduce the Israelites into who are wandering through that region to participate in these pagan cults. Um, and and participate in these these um, pagan orgies, basically. Uh, and Israel, once again, is judged severely for it. And so Hosea is bringing up the history 
of Israel and some of the worst occasions in the history of Israel to describe the fact that it's not much better now. So not a very positive text here in Hosea uh, 9. Let's move over to 2 Kings 16. Uh, and so what was what's the, the, the negativity that we see in, in Hosea 9 uh, is we see some of the reasons uh, for that being played out in the history here in 2 Kings 16. Now, it's focusing here on King Ahaz and Judah. Um, and this is the king that is, uh, is really, um, you see a lot of, of, a lot more of him in a bad way in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah spends a lot of time, especially in the first part of the book of Isaiah, interacting with Ahaz. Remember that Isaiah was a relative of the king. Uh, so he had, um, he was in that line and he had access to the throne. And so he had us uh, through the reign of Ahaz and then subsequently through his son, Hezekiah, uh, Isaiah has the ear of the king. And uh, he definitely needs to bring some things to the ear of the king with the reign of Ahaz. Ahaz was uh, one of the worst kings of, of the nation of Israel. Uh, by the way, I think a couple of Christmases ago, I, I preached on uh, the Messiah through the eyes of Isaiah. And uh, those texts where it talks about, for instance, um, you know, for unto us a son is born, unto us a son, is, a child is given, uh, that's during the reign of Ahaz. Uh, when these texts are given. And so you can understand why Israel is looking forward to a king who will, will reign in righteousness, who will uh, execute justice in the land, uh, who will set up the eternal throne of, of David. Uh, it's in the context of this, uh, what's going on here with King Ahaz, which uh, as you read through this account, you'll see just how bad he is. Uh, he's one who follows the pattern of all the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, participating in their idolatry. He even, verse 3, makes his son pass through fire. In other words, he uh, participates in child sacrifice, burning up of his own uh, son. Uh, again, very much a Canaanized king, you could even say, uh, acting not just like the kings of Israel, but the, the kings of, of Canaan. Uh, well, what happens during his reign is that he has the, um, the Arameans and Israel uh, fearing for their lives, because the Assyrians are uh, on the rampage, uh, they're trying to get Israel, to, uh, Judah, to come alongside and fight alongside of them. And Ahaz refuses, and so uh, Aram and Israel attack Judah to try to get them to join in. Um, Ahaz subsequently then appeals to, of all things, to Assyria. Uh, Syria is glad to come in and um, and help them quote help them out by attacking the Arameans and the Israelites, and ultimately this will result in the ending of the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and uh, in so doing, Ahaz, and we have even records of this in Assyrian uh, records, Ahaz ends up paying the Assyrians uh, these uh, with all the treasures of the kingdom, including some of the treasures within the temple itself. Uh, so we see how evil uh, Ahaz has gotten, and it ends uh, with Damascus falling, uh, which of course was the um, capital of the Arameans, and then we have um, at the end here, at the very end, we have maybe a sign of hope, uh, because we have Hezekiah, who's about to become king, um, but we don't get to Hezekiah until chapter 18. Chapter 17 will also be depressing, just as a warning. So that's Second Kings. Uh, let's move over to Psalm. Psalms uh, one. What are we at? One twenty-six through one twenty-eight. So Psalm one twenty-six through one twenty-eight. Remember that in the Psalms we are still in the Psalms of ascent, um, and the first of these is uh, one that's actually reflecting, I think, on the um, on the the exile, uh, probably the exile, uh, the Babylonian exile. Uh, the, the, it talks about the captive ones being brought back to Zion. Uh, those, it's probably a, a phrase you've heard quoted, a verse you've heard quoted before, those who sow in tears will reap in joyful shouting. And so there's that, the, that kind of, that context of the exile, I think, helps us to understand the significance of those words. You know, we apply them perhaps on a, on a very personal basis that, you know, God's going to uh, minister to us in our tears and turn our tears into joy. Well, for the Israelites, their tears are tears that come from, of course, the, 
the Babylonian exile itself, being removed from their land, having everything that they're based their faith on uh, jerked out from underneath them. Those who so who who were tearful during that time, uh, the psalmist says that the God that God will will restore them and bring them joy. Psalm one twenty seven one twenty eight, on the other hand, still psalms of uh, ascent again that would be sung on these pilgrimage journeys up to Jerusalem. But these are more psalms uh, that we would characterize as wisdom psalms. So wi psalms that speak of um, wisdom themes, like, for instance, verse 1 of uh, Psalm 128, fearing the Lord. Um, these are also, these two psalms are really famous. In fact, I, I almost preached on a couple of these psalms during my Summer of Psalms sermon series, because uh, these are two psalms that are famous for um, speaking of the, of, uh, the family. And, um, for instance, and, and the, the effect ultimately of, ha of living your life wisely as a leader in the family, as a, a parent, uh, is that you will uh, be blessed and you'll be in right covenant relationship with God. And remember that, uh, the, the Psalmist and the book of Proverbs as well, spend so much time on building healthy families because they are ultimately the building blocks of the covenant community of faith. You have healthy families, you have healthy, healthy uh, a healthy covenant community. Modern day sense, if you have healthy families, you have healthy churches, right? So uh, those are Psalm 128 and Psalm 127. Uh, speaks of, of course, famously, the children being a gift of the Lord. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Again, several times in this text, it talks about this idea of blessing, and that's not happiness, uh, although blessing can bring happiness, but happiness is a feeling. Blessedness is a state, a state of being in right relationship with God and covenant. So Psalm 126 through 128. And then finally, that brings us to Titus 2. Uh, here we see some really similar things that we saw um, Previously in the book of Timothy, uh, where if you remember, Timothy is being instructed by Paul on how to deal with various uh, groups within the church, typically divided by age groups. So how do you deal with the, um, the older uh, men, older women, younger men, younger women, and so on and so forth. So you can read through that. We've, we've talked about uh, this book before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but I do want to draw your attention to the last part of this chapter um, that Paul gives a really great explanation of the Christian life, I think. He talks about how the grace of God has appeared, and when grace, the grace of God appeared in our hearts and our lives, it brought salvation to all types of men, right, including us. Uh, it is an effective type of, of grace that God uh, does what he intends to do, and he uh, has brought us uh, salvation that we did not earn uh, through um, any, any action on our part. But because of the grace of God that we re receive, uh, this is uh, our response is to deny in our own lives ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age, because the, the present age is not that way, right? Uh, and we are looking, and how do, we, how do we live out that life? How do we live a life in, in a way that's going to deny godliness? Well, we look forward, right? So we don't look at what we're um, what the world is saying we're missing out on, but we're looking forward to what we will one day have, which is, I hope, uh, that is uh, the, the appearing of, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, verse 13. Uh, and then Paul talks about what Jesus has done for us. He gave himself to redeem us from every lawless deed. And so uh, we have been bought out of that old, uh, old life. We have uh, another image of salvation here, this idea of redemption. He has redeemed us out of that. Let's not go back to Egypt, even as Hosea was talking about, right? Uh, don't go back to Egypt and to the, to the old way of life. You have been redeemed out. Live as God's people, in other words. Uh, and that's the reason why he uh, sacrificed himself in the, in the first place, uh, is to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Uh, this gets back to the the idea that God doesn't save us just to save us. He saves us to become part of a holy and pure uh, people uh, for himself and for his glory. So wonderful little uh, exhortation and description of the gospel and the Christian life here on the part of Paul and, and Titus 2. So I think that's all the text for today. Hope you have a great rest of the day on this day, November 3rd, 2021.